Good evening, families. My name is Heather Deer, and I am the Assistant Director of Parent and Family Programs. Welcome to our webinar series. We are delighted that you have joined us this evening, and we are thrilled that you want to spend time learning about pre-orientation programs at William & Mary. That's the topic of our conversation this evening. We're going to be talking about the four amazing pre-orientation programs that are available to your student. So we are going to go ahead and get started, and before I do, I want to go over a couple of housekeeping tips for you all. We like to use the Q&A feature in Zoom to allow you to ask questions. You can find that at the bottom of your screen labeled Q&A. You can type your questions there in that box, and we will go through them at the end of the program. We'll ask as many questions as we have time for. We have some amazing <laughs> experts in the room this evening who will share with you about the pre-orientation programs at William & Mary, and I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to them. Hello everyone, my name is Shanae Owens, and I serve as the Associate Director for the Center for Student Diversity, and in the capacity of PLUS, I serve as the coordinator of the program. So PLUS, as you can see, is Preparing for Life as a University Student. It's a pre-orientation program out of the Center for Student Diversity. So PLUS is going to look a little different this year as we are navigating our new normal, our new worlds under COVID-19. So we have transitioned our PLUS program to an online format this year. So our PLUS dates will run Sunday, July 12th through Thursday, July 16th on an online format. Um, that being said, we're hoping to do a on-campus retreat in August. So that'll allow um, students who belong in the PLUS cohort a time to commune together and further get to know each other when we come back together in the fall. So we'll do an online platform in July and the hope is for us to do an on-campus um, program for those who participated in July when we come back in August. Um, the cost for PLUS is completely funded through the university. Um, applications are open now and the deadline to apply is May 31st. So students who are usually involved in the PLUS program, we serve um, the Center for Student Diversity focuses on um, underrepresented and underserved populations. We're usually, the purpose of the program is to get students acclimated to William and Mary as a transition from high school into that university life. So these are some of the highlights of the PLUS program. So we'll still have some mock class sessions. So we have some faculty members, William and Mary faculty members who are on board to teach some virtual classes. Uh, we'll have evening activities each night that are led by our PLUS counselors. And our PLUS counselors are current William and Mary students. We'll also engage in some group sessions. So there'll be some breakout sessions each night so that the students will get to know their counselors as well as each other. There'll be an introduction to the Center for Student Diversity because we encourage the students once they arrive on campus to have that connection to our office and be able to have a home within the university. It's also a time to get um, an understanding of undergraduate research. Many students don't understand that you can start doing research your freshman year. Other university uh, research is more towards senior year or graduate school, but William & Mary prides itself on conducting research for undergraduate students. So we introduced that day one within the PLUS program. There'll be different panel discussions that will be led by William & Mary students, as well as a dis panel discussion presented by William & Mary faculty. Each day will consist of a class, a campus resource, a workshop, evening activity, as well as some peer-led sessions with the counselors. So here is just some information for you in terms of how to apply to the PLUS program. The deadline to apply is Sunday, May 31st. I've included the link to the website that gives you more information about the PLUS program, as well as list some testimonials from class 
Pass Plus participants. Also, we're very active on Facebook as well as Instagram. So you can look at pictures from past years. And if you'd like to get in touch with me, the easiest way to do so would be at plus at blamingmary.edu. If you have any questions in reference to the program or the application process. Again, if you have any questions, make sure to add that in the Q&A feature and we'll come back at the end. Hi, my name is Josh Burke. I'm a professor and chair in our Department of Psychological Sciences and co-chair of the Neurodiversity Working Group. I'll tell you a little bit about our Neurodiversity Summer Bridge Program. So what I wanted to start with is just a little bit of an overview, if that's a term that you're not familiar with, what is neurodiversity? It's a philosophy and emerging civil rights movement that came out of um, a focus on individuals with autism and not just viewing those individuals as having impairments, but a balance of recognizing that those individuals have considerable strengths along with challenges. So it's not to minimize the challenges, but not to exclusively focus on them and have more of a balanced perspective of what uh, individuals with autism can contribute in all facets of society. Um, and with other, and it's sort of expanded to other areas such as ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and other um, conditions as well. And this is just to give you a sense of some of the different aspects to neurodiversity from obsessive compulsive disorder to aspects of dyslexia, including autism and Tourette's. So really just arrange, try and be as open as possible in terms of thinking about individuals who might want to be part of our neurodiversity community at William & Mary. So just to give you a little bit of an overview of the initiative more broadly, um, we have a neurodiversity working group that's very broad based in terms of uh, its membership. So it includes faculty, students, um, administration, alums. So it's really pretty broad reaching in terms of those on campus. We've had individuals who are part of residence life, um, student accessibility services. So, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a few, but those are a lot of the groups that are involved. One of the key facets when we developed this initiative is that we wanted it to be for the students on campus. And so one of the things we started very early on was a neurodiversity student group, which has grown to a listserv of about 100 students. And so this is an opportunity they meet on a weekly basis. It's an opportunity for them to just have a chance to talk about whatever challenges are or whatever they just want to talk about for fun. The faculty are not there at those meetings. It's really run by the students for the students. Um, we also do co-teach courses, uh, a course on neurodiversity. It's a one credit pass fail course um, that's offered once per year on campus and once at our William and Mary, at our uh, Washington DC at William, William and Mary office. And then here today, we'll focus on the bridge program in more detail. But I just wanted to start with giving a little bit of a sense of how this fits more largely within initiatives on campus. And we've also have reached out to other universities um, and kind of shared what we're doing on campus as well. Finally, the last part for the part that I'll conclude with is talking about, we do have a neurodiversity scholar in residence, John Elder Robeson, who's a best-selling author. Um, he was diagnosed with Asperger's, which is no longer a diagnosis, but uh, falls under the autism spectrum. And so he was diagnosed in his early 40s, and since then he's written several books about his experiences. He's also on the World Health Organization. He just finished a stint um, on the National Institutes of Health as well in terms of guiding funding related to autism research. And so to have his perspectives for our students, A, he can talk about what he experienced growing up, but then also bring in that broader perspective of how does this fit in more broadly within society and within the world is just a tremendous benefit for our students um, and for our campus as a whole. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Leslie Henderson to talk about more details with regard to the bridge program. Hi everyone, I'm Leslie Henderson and I'm the uh, Director of Student Accessibility Services as well as an Associate Dean within the Dean of Students Office. And I wanna tell you about the Bridge Program itself. Um, I wanna transport you back to a world where we could do things like have group hugs um, a few weeks ago really. Um, but back in summers prior to the summer, we were able to hold an in-person program. Um, we do plan to keep all of the same ideals and values of the in-person program, but we're going to have it on one day and online. So actually, it may be more accessible to, to many more students who want to participate this year. And like the PLUS program, it's at no cost to students. Um, so we'll talk more about the actual structure of this year's program now. 
So what we want to do is make sure that students who are neurodiverse have their needs considered as we welcome them to campus. What we do as part of the application process is ask what goals the students have when they want to participate in the program and that helps us design our program to meet the needs of students. We try to be inclusive. We allow students to walk around, lie on the floor if they want to, or however they're most comfortable able to experience um, getting to know the university as, as we introduce it to them in the bridge program. We have a STEM toy bucket in person that we often use, and so that'll be encouraged too during this online program. And we connect um, through the GroupMe app with the students. The students get to connect with each other that way and with the peer leaders. Um, who help facilitate that, that group connection. The peer leaders are also, like the PLUS program, are student, current students at William & Mary who participate in the neurodiversity program, um, student group that Josh described earlier. Um, and they also may be some recent alums who like to come back and give back to the students in this way. We want students to be, to have a softer, gentler um, introduction to campus life as orientation can be overwhelming. Um, so we help foster the social engagement between the peer leaders and the students who can kind of serve as mentors and the incoming students who participate in the program. Um, really living to learning in terms of what we focus on. Dr. Burke even um, offers a mock lecture for students and it's always interesting to see how quickly these students will engage in discussion um, about content with others um, who they're getting to know in the program. We also offer a listserv for parents who are um, who share students in the same cohort of the of the neurodiversity bridge program because we find that they tend to um, get information from each other and really appreciate having someone else who understands their students transitional experience at some level. Go to the next slide. Here is our online format. This is a work in progress and we're still nailing down details, but as you can see, we'll have starting at nine o'clock, we'll have some 40 minute sessions at the top of each hour with a break. Students can also take breaks whenever they need to, and we'll cover many different topics um, to help introduce students to student life and student learning on campus. At the very end, we also have a parent and family panel for parent and family questions. That goes on at the same time as our student panel, which is just for students only. So us boring old staff people and professors, we get out of the room so the students can have their own question and answer um, real time with, with students, um, with the peer leaders who are leading the program. We really think that this offers students a, a way to connect early and have some connections on campus before they get here. We also provide additional support such as resource books, program guides for the weekend. Students can get used to a Blackboard site and we just really pave a way for students to continue their connections on campus, um, especially for students who consider themselves neurodiverse and, and want that kind of connection. And we tend to get rave reviews, um, not to toot our horn, but um, we, we really do, we have had a lot of great feedback from students and from their families who have talked to their student participant afterwards to say what a great experience it's been. So our registration is live currently, the link is here, and I understand Heather will be able to distribute this information to you all afterwards, so you can just click the link. So if your student wants to participate, the deadline is Tuesday, June 30th, and then we'll get them in the group me and, and start building some relationships with students. Um, if you have questions, please contact us at sas at wm.edu or through the phone number we offer here. Hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth Miller and I am the Associate Director in William Mary's Office of Community Engagement as well as a class of 2011 alum. So I want to say yet another welcome to the William & Mary family and tell you a little bit about our Seven Generations Pre-Orientation Program, which is focused on having incoming students build and serve community together. The program runs for the four days before move-in, so this year that will be August 17th through 21st, and has spaces for 30 incoming students who will be split into three teams of 10, each led by two upperclassmen students who are trained and then coordinated overall by myself. And what we want this program to do is help our students understand their new community, feel more prepared to be part of the Lily Mary community, but also to be able to make a difference 
in the Williamsburg community and be introduced to what it means to be an active citizen and a participant in sustainable communities. So we actually know that there are three things that need to happen to create a sustainable community. Students need to become educated about the communities they're a part of, the social issues that are at play. They need to participate in direct action. That's what a lot of people think of in community engagement is that service piece. So that is core to our work, but as is the third piece, which is reflection. So understanding your place in community, evaluating the choices you make so that you can be of greater impact in your community, but also grow yourself. So I want to talk a little bit first about education because people often picture lectures and PowerPoint slides for education. As you know, those are great forms, but what you should really be picturing for our seven generations education program is that the students will be going on behind the scenes tours with Goodwill to learn about the Goodwill Works program and creating sustainable job opportunities. They will be meeting with scientists at VIMS to learn about how to talk about climate and coastal resiliency. They'll be having conversations with city councilors to talk about how we build sustainable economies, which will be particularly important in the coming months and years to come. So that's what you should picture when you think about education on our pre-orientation programs. And when you think about action, there are so many different service and direct action opportunities that students will have as part of this program. It means that on um, one day they might be working in a community garden to put down new mulch. The next day they might be prepping meals for a local nonprofit organization. And the next day they'll be helping to set up Dormania, a sustainability initiative on campus, taking lots of different approaches to understanding how they can contribute to community. And when we talk about reflection, I hope what you can picture is a bunch of students gathered around a table, sharing a meal together, sometimes a meal they've made themselves. It's always amazing to me the number of students who say one of their best learning outcomes from our program is that they learned how to cook um, dinner for other people or how to scramble an egg for the first time. So picture them eating a meal that's probably pretty edible if they've made it with their site leaders uh, supervision and having a conversation about their day, responding to reflection prompts in journals, coming up with a group statement of their commitment to action for what comes next so that they know what they've learned and feel prepared for William and Mary and their own active citizen journey. Those are the three components of our community engagement approach, but there are also three components to sustainability. Many of us think about sustainability from an environmental perspective, and that's critical. Thinking about how we protect and preserve our environmental resources, our natural resources. So one of our teams on this trip will be focused on that environmental sustainability. So they'll be engaging in work like beach cleanups, that community garden that I mentioned. They may even work with our local county on the recycling program. We also think about sustainability when it comes to social engagement. So that's making sure that everyone is able to participate to their full capacity in community. So students who will be focused on social sustainability will be doing things like working with the village initiative to pack backpacks for back to school programs, working to support a community picnic to bring people together, or working at our equine therapy nonprofit partner, Dreamcatchers. And finally, that economic component. How do we build communities that have sustainable economies and make sure individuals have the economy that they need? So those students might be doing things like working at our Habitat Restore, working at Goodwill, and connecting with local businesses. So as you can tell, there's a diversity of experiences in pre-orientation that lets students get exposed to lots of different things about making a difference. And we still fit time for them to meet their new community. So in the evenings, after they've engaged in all that service, they'll engage in a whole range of activities. That might look like um, an evening where they go on a campus tour so that this map stops looking like squares and lines, but instead turns into a real place. Um, they'll go on a scavenger hunt around the city to learn about the resources available to them as students. 
they'll take a trolley ride, they may even take in a concert in Colonial Williamsburg. And remember, they'll be with their upperclassmen leaders throughout, so they'll have a chance to learn and talk and ask questions about what that means to be a Lily Mary student. So I just want to mention a few things for you to keep in mind. Um, our registration is open until July 15th. The registration is linked on our website and on the pre-orientation page as well. The program does come with a $135 registration fee that covers things like housing, food, and um, connections to our different community opportunities. But we are making the program free to any first generation or low income student and we offer scholarships of $75 um, to anyone who needs that. We never want finances to be something that keeps someone from accessing the community that they're a part of. And finally, I would just mention that if your student is interested in more opportunities for community or a pre-orientation isn't the right place for them to connect, we offer show day, which is a half day of service during orientation, and AIM-4, which is the year-long civic leadership program for first-year students. So thank you all for um, joining William Mary, and I look forward to having your students join our community in the fall. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael White. I am one of the assistant directors of Campus Recreation, and I oversee the outdoor recreation program that is referred to as the Tribe Adventure Program. So right off the, the bat, I'd like to just, you know, reiterate how, like my colleagues, we are trying to negotiate the COVID-19 restrictions. So most of the information I'm providing you now uh, is about programs that we have historically run. At this point, we have not been able to make um, concrete decisions about how uh, we will be running the program. Uh, unlike some of my colleagues, we're unable to go online for this, this pre-orientation program, which I think will be uh, very self-evident uh, after you hear a little more about the program uh, through the next video and through some of the presentation. And we, maybe we'll have a video. There we go. Well, so this is the last night of a week-long pre-orientation program. Um, we have six groups that have been out in the field doing everything from bike touring to um, backpacking in the Shenandoah National Park, caving, uh, tubing down the south fork of the Shenandoah River. And so on the last night, they all come together and converge here at Chickahominy Riverfront Park. And it's an opportunity for them to tell their story to one another, kind of really uh, reinforces that whole bonding experience they've shared all over. My favorite part of our trip was going to Amy's Garden, and picking delicious tomatoes and eating so much that I thought my belly was going to explode. My favorite part was playing cards because nice. that's what we do. <laughs> All right. I'm Charlotte. I was on biking. My favorite part was almost catching. True. <laughs> All the groups are going to meet up here and we'll have, you know, our 70 participants and all our leaders here and um, we'll play a couple of really big games with everyone, hopefully get everybody familiar enough with each other that they can see each other on campus and say, you were at the powwow, right? And I heard something about you, you went on a climbing trip. So that in their first couple weeks, they don't have to be complete strangers to at least something like this. They get, they'll get to orientation after this and have six, seven, or even more, depending on the trip, other friends that they already know and are already, oh, hey, how's it going? Like, they're already close. They spent a whole week only with each other. Um, I think it's a really cool thing. I always made friends at camp faster than like at school, just because it's just a different environment. So I was like, if I go to what is basically camp, I'll have plenty of friends before school. So I do feel like I made a lot of friends. Everyone on, that I went on the trip with was some of the best people I've ever met, honestly. And I didn't get to talk to everyone as much as I wanted to, but there were like at least half the people I got really, really close with, and I think that I will continue to talk to them for the rest of the four years I spent here.
So Pathways is a really unique and transformative opportunity for incoming students um, through a series of theme-based wilderness experiences, hiking, paddling, rock climbing. Um, these students get a chance to bond in a way that that you just can't uh, any other way. Uh, you heard one of the participants talking about how she knew how she bonded at summer camp and she saw this as, as like a college version of summer camp. Uh, it's a little more than summer camp for sure, but it definitely is that, that great opportunity. Students learn uh, to, to be self-reliant, they meet other students, so they come in with a, a strong community already, and they build you know, these, these amazing social skills that will help them be successful as college students. So just to highlight a few things about the, the program, um, Pathways is offered through our Tribe Adventure Program, which is the outdoor recreation arm of campus recreation. Uh, we celebrated our 10 year anniversary last year. Uh, every year it gets better. Um, we serve historically approximately 112 incoming freshmen um, and maybe a few uh, first time transfer students uh, each summer. Uh, those 112 are served in two different sessions. Uh, these are wilderness-based pre-orientation program, meaning um, there aren't hotels and dorms. These participants are sleeping in tents. Um, in many cases, they're hiking in, um, in rustic areas. Uh, every trip is a little bit different and has different amenities available to it, uh, but it is truly a, a wilderness-based program. Um, there are 12 options to choose from split between two sessions, so there's six trips in the field at any given time during those two weeks. Uh, the group sizes are between eight and 15 participants based on the activity that they're doing. Certain activities like our backpacking, um, we're only allowed to have 10 people within a group based on our permits and based on our leave no trace um, outdoor ethics that we practice. Um, there is no experience necessary. I know that's one of the most common questions is, you know, does my student need to have outdoor experience already? Uh, and the answer is absolutely no, they do not need experience, but they should be aware that the trip does require that they will be sleeping in a tent, that they'll be spending most of their day outside. And for some students, uh, that's, a, that's a big challenge and it takes a couple of days to kind of get into the groove of it. Um, it's led by 24, uh, 25 student trip leaders. Uh, these trip leaders go through an extensive amount of training um, the new trip leaders spend their entire first semester training and going on shadow trips with experienced trip leaders. Uh, but these leaders going into the field are William & Mary students. So not only will they be leading these activities that the students uh, will be participating in, they'll also be sharing their experience uh, as a William & Mary student, uh, which is just invaluable. It's also important to note that our trip leaders are Wilderness First Aid certified. Um, they must all carry current CPR, uh, and they are all Leave No Trace trainers as part of their training. So they will be teaching that sustainability part while they're in the field. So regardless of the format of Pathways this season, our dates for session one, they begin August 10th and it runs through the 14th. So it is a week-long program, and session two would begin on the 17th running through the 21st. One of the questions we often get is on that last week, uh, doesn't that back right up to orientation? And the answer is yes, it does. Uh, and we get the participants back early in the morning that Friday. Uh, they actually spend their last night, as you saw in the video, camping at a nearby park, Chickahominy Riverfront Park. So they're about 15 minutes away from campus. So they arrive in plenty of time to de-issue their gear, to get ready, some jump in the shower in the locker rooms at the student rec center, and then they jump right into their orientation program. Now, historically, the cost has been $195 per, per participant, and that's all inclusive. That covers all the campground fees, all the food for the whole trip, all of the group gear, um, that includes everything. But because we're not exactly sure the format of this season's pathways, um, we haven't set a price on that yet. And we're hoping that over the next few weeks as we find out what the state of things will be come August, whether or not we will be able to travel and go into the field or whether we'll be doing an abbreviated version on campus. Um, typically, there's an application that opens May 1st, but again, uh, due to our, you know, figuring out the details of what this year will look like, 
um, we are accepting interest requests. So instead of an application, if you go to our website, you'll click on the interest, it'll ask for some basic information. And as soon as we know what we're doing for this season, we'll be sending out an email to everyone, letting them know about the application process, the cost, and what the program will look like this season. And just to give you an idea of the types of activities that um, these students will participate in, of course, camping is a big part of it because that's where they stay throughout their entire trip, no matter what the activity. But we send a few groups backpacking in the Shenandoah National Park. Uh, we have one group go into the field each session to do canoe camping. We have a group that focuses completely on rock climbing and they visit a couple of our uh, Virginia rock climbing locations. Uh, we have a bike tour. We also have a program that's become very popular called Adventure Shenandoah and this is a base camp style program where the participants stay in one campsite throughout their entire experience and each day go out and do things like rafting on the Shenandoah River and hiking to the famous waterfalls of Shenandoah National Park. We also offer a surfing, a stand-up paddleboard and sea kayaking trip that takes place at First Landing uh, State Park, which is located near Virginia Beach, and it's also a very popular uh, trip for us. So there's something in this for everyone, and I think the big take-home is that uh, you don't need a lot of experience, and when our students leave here, they are bonded in such a way that they know each other. We've actually begun doing research to see how long does that connection last. And we've been really excited to see for many students, um, this connection has lasted after graduation. They've stayed in contact with people that they did pathways with. And for that reason, we started offering alumni events. So each year we have a pathways alumni event and students who might have graduated who happen to be in the area or want to come to the area will come to that event. We have a big dinner and they get to talk about their experiences. Uh, and it's, it's quite a program. But again, this year, uh, quite a challenge. Uh, how do you support a traveling wilderness experience um, if we are practicing social distancing? And we have some great ideas for on-campus programs, uh, but that's all gonna kind of depend on the decisions made uh, at the administrative level at the college. But we're, we're confident we'll have a program to be offered. We're just not 100% sure what that's going to look like. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, I feel like I learned a lot during that experience of listening to you all talk about your programs, um, especially there's something it seems for almost every student to get involved in if being involved in a pre-orientation program is something that they're interested in. So we're going to go ahead and get started with Q&A. We have a few minutes, so please continue to submit those questions. Um, I'm going to start with, is PLUS limited to certain demographics or can anyone apply to the program? So I can answer that question by saying not that it's limited to a specific demographic, but it's targeted to a specific demographic in the fact that we are targeting our underrepresented and underserved populations. So that specifically meaning um, students of color, students from um, areas that um, such as like rural areas, um, students in terms of giving students access and getting them acclimated to campus, first generation students, low income, just a means to getting them um, support and giving them a community before they arrive to campus. Thank you, Shanae. Um, my next question is, are we going to upload this PowerPoint presentation so that everyone can access it? Yes, the session has been recorded. So if you wanna share it with your student or watch it later, you definitely can. And the PowerPoint slides will be posted on our webinars resources page on our website. We'll also send out all the links in upcoming newsletters so that you can access this webinar and all webinars in our series easily. So that's a great question. Um, and next question is about the community engagement program. So how are you planning differently because of COVID-19? That's a great question and I want to give thanks to Michael for doing a lot of the work on this one to say that um, like Pathways, we are operating with confidence that we'll be able to offer our program but not clarity on what that will look like. So um, I'm on webinars every day talking about what community engagement in this time looks like. And yeah, gotta love a webinar. <laughs> um, so we will continue to update. One of the nice things is that because our program 
works with community partners, we are very used to doing the last minute planning in short term because community partners require flexibility. So we're confident that we have the connections and that we will abide by the best practices for health. So what that will look like, we don't know for certain, um, but we will keep people updated. Wonderful. Thank you. It's, you know, a lot of things are kind of fluid right now. We're planning and all of our partners are really doing a great job of making sure that our students are having high quality educational experiences, even if it may look a little bit different than something that we're used to. So I'm happy to see that's continuing even with our pre-orientation programs. So I have a question here about the 1693 hat that's on the head. Um, the bookstore is a great place to go to get all of your gear. Also, parent and family programs, we are offering exclusive class of 2024 gear so shameless plug there if you haven't purchased your 2024 family shirt um, you can find that in your most recent newsletter if you're receiving those so I have another question here let's see how does priority work for pathways applications does expression of interest have any effect on the application that's a great question. Um, so historically, it has been first come, first serve for applications. The day we open, we're usually flooded with applications um, and we just start going in order. Um, typically, we try to get everybody a spot on a trip. And what happens is we give people an option of choosing their top three choices in order of which trip and which session. And so we do our best to give everybody their first uh, choice. And then as we get more and more applications, people start getting their second choice. And as we get down to the end of those 112 slots, um, we, you know, some people you might get their third choice, but typically we can get people at least to their second. Then typically what happens is towards the end of it, when we start having a waiting list, and we usually have a waiting list of around 30 or 40 people, as people then have to cancel out, we try to pull people back into those spots and give them their first choice. Now this year, since we're doing an interest um, instead of an application to start, um, the only benefit that that would provide is it gives us an idea of the numbers of people who are interested and they will most likely be the first, pers first people to hear about when and where to complete their application. But then we will also do additional marketing that will go out to all incoming students. Um, so by giving us your interest information, you'll get a direct email from us saying, hey, uh, on Wednesday of whatever, um, we'll be opening applications and we'll give you a link and that kind of stuff. So does it necessarily guarantee you a better chance at getting a spot? Um, what it does is you'll get information more directly and quicker about what the program is going to look like. Thank you for that. I have a question here wondering if there are other programs or orientation meetups for students. Um, and I will say that for our incoming students, our partners in first year experience will be offering virtual opportunities for communities to connect with one another. So your student can be looking at their William and Mary email for those invitations. Also, we are doing regional parent and family and new student welcome receptions, welcome events over the summer. Um, these are happening virtually and you will receive those invitations in your email and your student and their email. You can look for those invitations coming probably late this month, possibly early June, but, but do be on the lookout for those. Plenty of opportunities for students and families to connect with one another um, before arriving at William & Mary. I have a question here. Can you talk for a minute about Pathways student leaders? Um, you mentioned that students train during their first semester. Um, how do students prepare to be a student leader? And I think it would be nice to hear about all of your programs. How do you prepare your students to help mentor incoming students? Well, that's a great question. And just speaking on Pathways, um, we have an application process and it of our very large tribe adventure program, the trip leader position is the most coveted. And so a lot of our trip leaders have actually completed pathways and that's their first introduction into the tribe adventure program. And so typically um, their freshman year or sophomore year, um, when we do the application process in the fall, we get about 50 applications and we usually have about five spots open. So it, it's pretty competitive to get in. And once they are hired, almost immediately we do a fall training 
And so we take um, the group, the new cohort, as well as some of our experienced and senior leaders, uh, and we go up into the mountains and we spend a week doing basic backcountry living skills. Um, and then we come home and we do another training in the winter that's all soft skills, understanding how to work with people, understanding situational awareness. Um, and then we add their medical training. They all get wilderness first aid training, which we pay for. It's nationally recognized through the National Outdoor Leadership School. Uh, and so they spend a weekend getting that training. Then they go and do their, their CPR first aid kind of stuff that complements the wilderness first aid. And then we literally have trainings uh, throughout their whole first semester they're required to go to. There's one big overnight weekend training once a month in each one of our areas. So they get their American Canoe Association training and paddling for all of our paddle sports. We do a rock climbing experience and training for top rope rock climbing. Um, and then they shadow the experienced trip leaders. So for their whole first semester, they're not given students to take out. They actually go along and assist the trip leaders and see how our trips run. And that's all in addition to all the general campus recreation training that they're required to have. Um, you know, we have a, a training conference at the beginning of each semester. Um, there's various trainings throughout. They have to do a van training since all of our, our travel programs uh, utilize our vans. So it's a pretty extensive training. And they're evaluated each semester and we look for areas that they need more training. Continuing ed goes through each year that they work for our program. So they get all of that their initial first semester. And then they're required to have a certain amount of continuing ed each semester. So uh, they might do rock climbing a second time their second semester, and they continue to get that training throughout. Okay. Would anyone else like to tackle that question of how you prepare your student leaders to mentor incoming students? I'll just share quickly that our student leaders, the majority of whom are actually leaders in our alternative break program. So these are experiences during the academic year where they travel to communities away from campus. So they've gone through a course and training. Um, and many, if not all, of our program leaders for seven generations are also alumni of the program. So they've got the specific training of leading trips and the direct experience of the program. Similar to the PLUS program, so most of our um, PLUS counselors were plus participants in their um, in the summer prior to their freshman year and they chose to apply to be counselors based on their experiences and in terms of the training um, I essentially come up with the base of the schedule but I rely heavily on the counselors to decide what faculty members they would like to see um, throughout the week as well as what evening activities um, they shape the workshops and the panel discussions. So I rely heavily on the current students to shape what the week looks like because they essentially are William & Mary students and know what an incoming student would need in terms of an experience of what they need to prepare. Similar to that, for the students in the neurodiversity program, the ones who are the peer leaders tend to be in the neurodiversity student group or and or have participated in the bridge program in the past. So they have hands on experience with being a participant and knowing what students might want and or need to know. Thank you all so much. I have to give you all just a big round of applause. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. Um, thank you so much for putting so much energy and intention into welcoming our new students and being willing to talk to our families. I really do appreciate it. That wraps us up this evening. If you did not get your questions answered, please email us at families at wm.edu and me and others are so happy to answer your questions as you have them. I will forward them along to all of our panelists here today. Thank you all so much again for joining me and thank you families for being here. See you next time. Bye.